The aim of this project it is to foster a discussion about the role of design within the field of responsible innovation and um, as conceived at an international level. We speak about different topics included within the field of responsible innovation, such as knowledge-based society, inclusiveness, gender equality, open innovation, open sciences, ethical futures, just to mention some of them. In order to do it, we will collaborate within the students of our universities, developing forms of experiential learning through design projects realized at the national and international level. In the next 10 days, each university will open in each context a call for application for students and other selected guests and select which ones participate in the four, first workshop we will have in January 2021. Then we will organize as a second step of this appointment between June and July 2021, we, we, we are deciding about this uh, timing in, in this day, and we will organize a second workshop which will involve a selection of students from the three countries. Meanwhile, we will work as a researcher at an international level to share approaches, methodologies, and perspective about the topic of responsible innovation that we think is really, really a key topic of our common future. So today we are here to start officially this project with an international conference with three very, very important guests called by each university. It now gives me great pleasure to call Professor Rodrigo Ramirez to introduce the speaker. They will have more or less 20, 25 minutes for their speech. And after all the speech, the presentation, and after all the presentation, we will have a round table, a debate open to researcher, investigator, professor, students, and moderated by our colleagues from uh, the University of Bologna, the University uh, of the Tecnologico de Monterrey and de la Università Cattolica de Chile. So thank you all again for being here and then I, um, Professor Rodrigo Ramirez can introduce our very important guest. Thank you, Elena. Uh, benvenuti a tutti. Welcome everyone. Bienvenidos todos y todas to this uh, first uh, event, this kickoff of uh, the Winter School uh, in Responsible Innovation. Towards an engaged education for future designers, Mark Wood is uh, trained professionally as an architect, holding a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Tecnologico de Monterrey in 1990, and a Master of Architecture from the University of Texas at uh, Austin in 1994. He has practiced in the field of architectural and urban design. He is uh, now presenting uh, a professor from uh, Tecnologico de Monterrey uh, and he is introducing his presentation now. Uh, Mark, you have uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I will notice you when you uh, get past uh, 15 minutes. The screen is yours. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, and everyone for the invitation. Um, I'm not sure I can, uh, if I can present. Um, um, there we go. Can you see my, my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. perfect. So thank you very much, and it's wonderful to be able to uh, participate in this uh, inaugural conference for the Winter School proposal with these uh, three great institutions. And I think I, I, this presentation will tie up uh, very nicely to with what Lydia was uh, uh, proposing and discussing about her great work, um, the idea of engaging education. And I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the experience of the Tecnologico de Monterrey 
as we move through the transformation of our educational model. So um, this is a, something that I think will resonate with everyone here uh, as designers and people who uh, engage with these wicked problems, these uh, perverse problems that we have in society in many ways, uh, social, environmental problems that are difficult to harness, difficult to, to define. And I go back to this origin of the, of the word, of the concept of uh, wicked problems from uh, this paper that had to do with specifically with urban planning and, and tell it, saying how difficult it is to bring basis of uh, scientific uh, uh, processes and scientific truths uh, to social and environmental problems because the nature of these problems is complex, as we all know. Uh, this is a very interesting graph from the work of uh, Terry Irwin and Gideon Kossoff in uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And you'll see how uh, the mapping of wicked problems can be done. It is very complex across different levels, different um, uh, moments in time. Uh, but I think this is the kind of work that we have to start developing in order to understand very precisely how we uh, should address problems and how should we define them as we go forward. Uh, there's, of course, a trajectory that is historical and that defines us where we are today. And then the, the job of the designer in, in, in a very ample way is to try to understand this current condition, where, how we got here and the possibilities for the future. And I, I like always to, to look back to Herbert Simon and his seminal book of the sciences of the artificial where a project for design is really located in many ways. And this is just to, to illustrate that the, the project or the, or the, or the uh, agenda of design is very broad, uh, as we all know, uh, probably in this group particularly. Um, but this definition, I think, is wonderful in terms of, of design. That, and design, of course, covers many fields and many levels and, and scales of problems and scales of, from project to services to experiences to territories, etc. And there's many actors uh, that I would like to talk about in this presentation that, that are not only necessarily designers, but also architects and other people who deal with this field. But this definition, I think, is beautiful in terms of how things, not we, con we don't concern ourselves with uh, how things are. We have to understand them to, in order to define how they might be, how we move from a current condition to a preferred condition in the future. Uh, and this, uh, of course, is where design finds itself as an interface between these other two cultures, the, the culture of science uh, and, and how it can be quantified and understood uh, in terms of facts and very, very precise facts and the field of humanities and how human qualities and human processes can be understood as well. So design, I think, uh, and I think we all agree with this definition in terms of the, the, the colleagues that are here from the different universities, that design is this, this possible interface, wonderful interface between uh, what can uh, be possible, why we should do this uh, 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 an, an innovation, and is it desirable, is it, is it feasible to, to produce. Um, and this, of course, ties to the, the whole project of sustainability, and there's so many definitions of this, but I like uh, the work of uh, Arnim Week and others uh, uh, based on the transition design theory uh, and, and how we might look into the future to sustainability visions that can be shared, that can be defined in a, in a participatory way as well. Uh, how we, to get to those or to define those, we need to understand the current situation and the scenario, the complex scenario of these wicked problems that we, we, we discussed initially. Uh, how we might also be able to define scenarios of, of intervention and then how we might go back from those visions, those scenarios uh, to the current state and try to uh, establish sustainability transition strategies. Uh, and, and through this, I think the, the competencies that we have to instill in future designers, you can see some of these here, but they all have to do with anticipation, with the capacity to, to settle norms and, and laws and, and consider the different values and the different uh, ethical considerations of, of diff distinct groups. And I think that interpersonal competence that you see in the middle is something that has to do a lot with how we train future designers and how we go about our different uh, projects. I think Ligia illustrated very clearly uh, some of these uh, ways of, of doing some of the tools that we have for doing this. So responsible innovation, of course, uh, uh, the, the critical, critical piece has to do with um, uh, scientific and technical innovation. For example, nanotechnology and uh, the genome, genome Project have had uh, these uh, preoccupations from the start 
more than 30 years ago in, in some cases um, in terms of defining the ethical, the legal, the social implications. And you can see in the circle some of those things that have to do with values and with uh, personal social aspects uh, more importantly than, than the scientific or the, or the, or the technical aspect or the, of a product or, or, or of, a, of, a, of a new process. Uh, and there's, of course, many models of this. I look at this uh, model of anticipation, reflection, engagement, and action uh, from the United Kingdom uh, unit that has to do with, uh, with uh, innovation and, and scientific development. And for this presentation, I, I want to focus on the E, on engage on the engagement, how we might train our future designers and how we also might train ourselves in terms of, of um, engaging better. And engaging just means interacting or interested in someone in, in something and keep them thinking about it or to become involved, have contact uh, with someone or, or, or something. So um, I would like to talk in, 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 in these sense of, of how we are trying to move through engagement. And I think this is just an ongoing project. I think. We have been working for several years and just are into our, our second cohort of uh, students that have started a new educational model at Tec de Monterrey in all the programs, not only in design and architecture and art, not only in our school, but across all the disciplines. Uh, and of course, we have a number of aspirations that I would like to talk about briefly and then, uh, but I think most of this is just still opportunity, still in the process of, of improving and, um, and of defining how we go about in the future uh, in order to, to, to complete this agenda for, for this transformation of our model. But basically um, the, the challenge is the center of the model. We look to develop our students in terms of competencies that, they, that will allow them to work on challenges in the future. So our whole model is based on challenges. This is not the only menu of challenges, but of course the global goals for sustainable development uh, offer us a wide array of, of the main challenges that we can face, these wicked problems that we have in the world and we can face in many ways. And, and of course, these challenges are more and more um, not constrained to a single discipline. Um, a challenge is called disciplines that are, should be uh, collaborating. And I think that's one of the big aspirations that we have in this model, that we're still working perhaps in disciplines and more and more we have to look into how we create spaces for interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, which is, of course, the way we work in the in the world. Um, so challenges are the way we, we design the, the, the model. This is basically also done in terms of blocks of professors and students that work around the challenge and some content, some disciplinary content and some transversal content is uh, taught, but also mo most importantly, it is uh, working around the challenge and solving it to in order to, uh, to is, is the way we do it in the in the, in the in the classroom in this new educational model. Um, and of course, so students and faculty, groups of faculty and students work around the challenge. Uh, this is, again, probably more familiar to us in the studio environment, in the traditional project uh, development that we have in our schools of architecture, art, design. Uh, but in, in, for other disciplines, of course, this is a quite a, a bit of a challenge and, and a change. Uh, the other element that is very important is, is partners, and I will go around the briefly in each of these, but uh, partners, of course, uh, are, are groups or organizations that we look uh, into to, to work around these challenges and form part of the definition and part of the potential solution. And something that probably we have to look more deeply and, and embed this more clearly in, in all we do is, of course, where all of this process happens, no? which is uh, society and environment. Sometimes uh, partners forget that uh, they're not uh, users of society and environment only, that they're also uh, embedded and have to work uh, around it. So this is where engagement probably comes into play. So I would go very quickly in, in some of the things that I think just to sort of thought experiment in terms of uh, how we're moving around these different elements. And I would like to start with uh, the, the first two elements around the challenge, which are the, the interaction between students and, and professors. And again, these are often not only a single professor leading a studio, but of course, groups of professors from different um, and backgrounds or disciplines in, in some cases, or that or, or they bring together, for example, technical, projectile, and, uh, and other elements to the, to the process of, uh, of, of the studio work. Again, we're familiar with this in our disciplines. Um, and there's this uh, explicit design of interactions between students in the studio, um, among them, 
between professors because they also have to coordinate in order to uh, align the different contents that they, they might teach into a single uh, challenge in, in, the, in the potential de development of that. And of course, there's the interaction between students and professors. Uh, this opens the, the way, and I think we still have a ways to go in terms of uh, interdisciplinary work. More and more, the challenges will have to call different disciplines in order to solve them. And this idea of um, how do we get out of the silos, of the disciplinary silos, and I think the key is to uh, work around the issues or the, or the, or the challenges in order to, to get out of the silos. So this will try to, this is a process I think that will allow us to get more a deeper understanding of wicked, pro wicked problems. And, and of course, technology has opened up uh, many uh, challenges uh, in, with the pandemic, um, but also in the, in the picture above with Carmelo Di Bartolo, that was a project that was uh, developed with our dean as well, uh, with a group of students working with a research group in, uh, in Monterrey. Uh, and using technology even before the, the pandemic. Of course, Tecno Monterrey has been a leader in, the, in that sense and uh, in, in, in using technology, but I think we have probably in the future uh, more and more opportunities to harness uh, technology and go beyond uh, Zoom and, uh, and other uh, things that we have had to do this uh, year uh, in, in for, to respond to this emergency. The second piece of engagement or the second discussion that I would like to um, show here is has to do with the partners, the um, um, educational partners that we look for for each of these challenges and each of these projects, each of the semesters. And of course, these are all types of organizations, businesses, uh, governments in some cases, NGOs. And here the collaboration should be across all, all elements, not only as a consulting or as a, a final uh, destinatory of, of the solution, but really we work with the partner. We try to work with the partner to define the challenge, to provide resources and to explore the solutions and, and this is a, a good example of, of a, a company a architecture and construction company in Guadalajara that uh, allowed us to develop a space a site where students and professors could work and, and, and develop the, the solutions that to a project that was part of the that was being developed at the time by the by the company by, by the group um, and even were, they even allowed us to challenge the, the results or the or the ideas that they had uh, regarding vertical building. Uh, so, of course, this leads us to uh, a very practical, very applied learning. I think that is probably something that, that is moving us very fast and the students are grasping very fast the, the application of the knowledge instead of sort of building it up through the different courses and then applying it. This is applied learning. Uh, and I also would like to reflect on this balance between academy and the real world. You know, we are often told that we have to get out of the uh, silver, uh, ivory tower and, and engage with the real world. But I always say that the real world also has to learn or can learn from the academy. And I think we're pushing the boundaries for many companies and governments and, and other organizations where we should push, push the boundary to go beyond the, the sort of green and social, um, very, very shallow green and social commitments that they might have and look at, at more profound uh, and more transformative um, ways of understanding. And of course, here, the things that Ligia showed us, the types of workshops and engagement that, that uh, is developed is something that, that we are all trying to do. And, and I think uh, that this is something that should be essential in every process and or most of the processes that we develop with our students. And of course, uh, there's all types of, of things from companies and communities and, uh, and governments or organizations that we've experimented with a number of, of things, again, opening up a lot of uh, possibilities for, for interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, in, in the third discussion here in terms of engagement, so the first two were students and professors, the other was uh, with our educational partners. The third one has to do with how do we engage with a broader social and environmental system. Uh, and of course, all our discussion about transition design and other types of, of, of approaches uh, want us to look at the whole system. And I think this is probably the greatest challenge that we have in terms of developing our students and our future designers uh, to make, uh, ensure that they have this complete view of uh, what the limits and consequences of society and, uh, and actions in the society and environment are. Uh, engaging with uh, the community and with different uh, actors in the community, of course, has to, uh, and of course with nature, uh, allows us to understand where we can intervene and what the short-term and long-term uh, impacts are. Um, and what scale we develop them. Um, and, and also I think this is, has to do a lot with how we decide with whom 
we participate and we and we uh, collaborate with uh, we have to uh, consult and, and empower and not, not only consult people some sometimes a lot of participation in the latter of participation stays at the consultation or information phase and really we have to move to a more uh, long-term relationship between the university and communities in order to to make a longer lasting impact and a more uh, adequate uh, intervention and finally and this is something that I, I think we've been thinking about more recently but this uh, engage engagement uh, of the student with him or herself <laughs> to call it in some way and i think one of the best the most important things that we have in, the, in our model is that there's a uh, both the disciplinary and transversal uh, competency that we want to develop and the, in, in the um, i think one of the most important con transversal uh, competencies that we that try to develop in our students is self-knowledge and management, autoconocimiento y gestión. And it's quite a challenge, at least in Mexico, uh, in terms of 18 to 22 year old students, uh, we're trying to uh, make them uh, become owners of their own process and not only passive receptors of, of information, of course. And, and this is quite a challenge. There's a number of opportunities that have been designed in the process. Uh, for example, weeks that we developed to to, for different activities. One of them, for example, might be to uh, make a plan of, of personal development and of, of life and how these different experiences that they're having it, having uh, formed their professional uh, competencies. Uh, at the end of each semester, we have designed a, an activity, which I think is probably very, very important for this, for this topic, which is Semana Vichocho, the last week of the semester, which is a moment of reflection around what they have learned and how that ties in with the rest of their preparation in the future. So that has to do with uh, this idea of, uh, of second order learning and how we um, not only learn from the actions and the results of our actions and how we might improve that in the future, but uh, how the results of our, of our actions also change us as human beings and change our students as human beings. And so I think this is where the values and commitment of students uh, have to be uh, discussed and, and reflected on. Uh, a very personal, probably, process in, in, in each case, but um, this is something that I think should happen in education and I think is another form of engagement. So, um, and to, um, uh, to, to finish, uh, I think design for sustainability is an ethical challenge in the end, of course, uh, and this is a definition that I just kind of re rewrote uh, from some documents that we had uh, for, in terms of the ethical ethics and competence and citizenship uh, competence uh, that is, has been defined also for, for our students. Uh, and I think that this definition captures a lot of what uh, I have been discussing here. No, a, a professional who acts responsibly, reflects, analyzes, and evaluates ethical dilemmas and applies his, her moral judgment to situations related to self, professional practice and surroundings, and respects all persons in the environment. This is quite an agenda where by no means uh, near uh, completing that, but I think it's probably the objective and the and the uh, the development that we should have in the future, and that I think we we, we would enjoy very much trying to uh, to develop this uh, with partners. And I think the winter school is built around this precisely, this explorations around this, and I hope we can have a very successful process. Um, and finally, uh, I don't know if I have this last idea from Herbert Simon, which I think also. Uh, makes us think about how our task as designers is to continue creating some variety and, and new niches for development and how uh, in the future we might be able to give new, uh, future generations uh, uh, the opportunity to pursue new and interesting designs as we have had. So with that I, I end and uh, thank you very much for your, your time and for the, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I just uh, want to, to add that uh, uh, Mark is since uh, March uh, 217. He's the Dean of the Western Region of, for the School of Architecture, Art and Design in Tecnologico de Monterrey, which includes operations in Guadalajara and six other campuses. Sorry, uh, I, I didn't mention before that uh, your, your current uh, role in Tec de Monterrey. So Thank many you thanks for your presentation. DJ you. has uh, presented about inclusive approaches. Mark is completing this idea of uh, responsible innovation with systemic approaches. 
probably uh, or surely, surely you have questions. Remember that you can write it down in the chat uh, area and we are collecting uh, your questions for the next round, uh, the, the round table uh, here. Uh, the following presenter is Jose Manuel Moller. Uh, his presentation is entitled From a Local Store Problem to the Global Wasp Solution. Jose Manuel is the CEO and founder of uh, Algramo. Uh, his undergraduate studies were in business administration in, in Universidad Católica. Additionally, he also holds a Master of Advanced Design here at the School of Design in Universidad Católica. Since 2013, Jose has been dedicated to creating and developing Algramo. Uh, in, few years, in few years, he has established Algramo across a network of more than 2,000 stores. Um, recently, he has spoken at United Nations Environmental As Assembly and uh, at high profile circular economy conferences in Europe. Jose is currently working with global brands with like uh, Unilever and Nestle to help, to help them use packaging in a more circular manner, helping catalyze reusable packaging systems on a globally significant scale. Jose, the screen is yours now. You can start your presentation. And Perfect. also, I will, I will notice, I will tell you when, when you're completing the, the time as uh, with the rest of our speakers. I will be giving keep, my time, so I'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm Jose Manuel, they call me, everyone call me Cote. I'm the CEO and founder of Algramo. And I once, you're seeing my screen now? Just confirm, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm leading um, a startup called Algramo that um, we have two aims. One, to keep the packaging into the economy and out of the environment. That's how we define what we're doing. To start telling you why, why I came with this, this is a picture of a low-income neighborhood in a municipality called uh, La Granja in Santiago. And here, while I was studying business and economics, I decided to move here with three other classmates um, because we were angry on what they were teaching us in terms of the companies that were meant only to produce income for the shareholders and the only externality to the countries just creating new jobs. We were agree on that and we, we thought that this could be much more. And we decided to change our environment and where we were living. And we we're supposed to spend a semester here, but we spent here a year and a half. And actually that house, that red house, um, is for three families. And we we're one of those three on the first floor. And living there, I was in charge of cooking and buying everyday stuff. And because in Chile, the universities are not meant for working and studying, we didn't have so much time, so we have a really low income. And I was purchasing in a small format in the mom pop stores that we call them almacenes in Chile. And each country has a different name, but it, it's everywhere. I'm pretty sure that in, in Mexico they have tienditas or bodegas, but exists everywhere. And doing that, uh, I didn't have enough resources, so I was purchasing the smallest format that they were offering at the store a quarter liter of cooking oil, a sachet for shampoo, a sachet for coffee, etc. And doing that, after a couple of months, I realized that per kilo, or per liter, I was paying up to 40% more than my mother because she was getting, I don't know, I came from a huge family, so the cooking oil, for example, comes in five liters, or the powder detergent comes in seven kilos. So the difference of that, uh, it was around 40%, and I put the name of the poverty tax. And that's the first reason that Agrama exists as a company. Then I started studying supply, uh, study, start studying supply, the supply chain, and I realized that most of that extra cost was linked with the packaging. The packaging in the smallest presentation could represent more than 50% of the cost of the, end, of the end product. For example, in dish soap, these are real numbers came from Unilever. Um, in the smallest presentation, that is a 200 milliliters bottle, the packaging represents around 55% of the cost. So what we're doing today, we're pushing the poorest families to pay for something that they don't need that is packaging and also that waste ends up in the same neighborhood. So for example, in Santiago today, you're not gonna find waste on the street in a high income area, but in the poor communities, you have uh, this, uh, this waste in all, all of the streets. And also this is absurd because from the eyes of the, the, the producer, they want to sell a product, not a packaging. 
the packaging today is excuse of how we are providing the product to the end consumer. So we create something that we call the, the, the packaging as a wallet and how this works has three main elements. First of all, an uh, Agram account. So you download the, the Agram account and pre-charge your account with your money, it could be credit, debit, and now we're working to have cash. Then all of our packaging has an RFID chip. So all of the, the, the packaging has a chip that is really by the third element that is the IoT connected dispenser machine. So each time that you're putting the packaging into the dispenser, the dispenser reads the packaging, reads the account and reads your balance. So for example, if you have $20 in your account and you want to pre-charge at $5, you can charge $5 like in a gas station. So this is one of the example of the, of the co-branded packaging, almost the most <clears throat> known and the first brand in Chile in, in laundry detergent is co-branded and on the bottom has Algramo and also has this icon of smart packaging. So we offer the product traceability, the consumer traceability, you pay with your packaging, that's why we call it the, the packaging as a wallet and also it's related with the idea of the user. Also we have this app where today we have one of the three solutions that is home delivery and you can arrange a visit from the dispenser, actually we'll show you in a one minute video then. We also, and something important, each time that someone is purchasing from us, we are telling them how much plastic they're saving. For example, this bottle here has the same plastic as the equivalent of 32 plastic bags. So we are counting into the app, and actually you can say there it says, Bolsas Editadas, how many plastic bags you have been saving. And based on that number, we give you a deposit into the chip for your next purchase. So the bottle is start having more value. So the first solution that we launched is a home delivery. We start with a home care products with Unilever. A couple of weeks ago, we launched also with Purina for pet food. So how this work? Again, this like work like a gas station. It's an electric tricycle that visits you at home, has two dispensers. We launched a couple of weeks ago, uh, the same one, but for pet food. So we're refilling pet food containers. All of those containers are smart containers. Here I have a video. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes? Great. Right. So here the, the audio is not important, but this I'm gonna show you how this works in real. And um, this is an electric tricycle unit, so people has this app that I was mentioning, and then they decide which purchase they want to do. Omo is a laundry detergent, which is the dish soap. They say when they want it, at what time, and then they schedule the, the visit of this electric unit. And each time that we're telling them how much plastic they're gonna be saving. Today, each unit has two dispensers. The new ones, they're gonna have three dispensers, sorry, four dispensers. Uh, all of this system works with uh, a smart packaging that has this RFID chip behind the label that is read by the system. There's always new packaging for new customers. This works like in a gas station, so you refill as much as you want, and um, paying the same price per liter. So here we're solving the poverty tax. And also we're communicating how much plastic you're safe, and based on that, we give you a deposit into the packaging for your next purchase. So today we have the most convenient price in the market. Today we're 30% cheaper than the average price of a Walmart here in Chile. We're avoiding the single use of plastic and also we give you this economic incentive for reuse. So how we are designing this, and, and always I design that we are designing this not only for the high income millennial vegetarian like me, we're designing this for everyone that makes decisions based on price. Because if we want to change the behavior of the consumer, the shortest way to do that is to with an economic incentive. So we're saying that this is the cheapest solution. And then over that, the ice on the cake is, is also more eco-friendly. In that way, we think that we could move uh, the, the behavior. Also, we have another solution that is gonna be for supermarket and retail. We're gonna be launching this in a couple of months in Santiago, and then the idea is to replicate outside. So we want to be the evolution of the shelf, Today we have tons of plastic on those shelves and we want to switch from just the product because actually the user needs to wash their dishes or to wash their clothes, not to have an extra packaging. And actually it's, it's time that someone has a packaging with us, we're adding a birth date into the system. So when you have that, it's gonna be the birth date, it's that day, and actually who's gonna be responsible of that packaging. Today we have these two business lines, one for pet food or one for home care. In the retail context, also we are adding a lot, a lot, no, a lot more like food. Even we are getting to beverages, candies, um, staples, etc. So we have been developing technology for several products. 
Uh, we're going to be also with the beverages on the go, hot and cold. We're expecting to be launching that in the coming month. And uh, we have contract with the global brands who today have the, the products. We are helping them to switch from single use to refill. We reach their standards. And we have these two uh, operations, one inside of the user that has this smart packaging, as I was saying, that they pre-charge their account. Then the spend depends on the product, if they need to sanitize or not the packaging before doing a refill. For example, think on a, a juice or water, you need to sanitize that packaging. Also, we create and patent that technology. Then you refill that packaging, and then we give you a deposit based on your impact for your next purchase. And from the B2B side, we are using reusable drums that are plugged into the dispenser that was sanitized and refill them again. So we have a double circular system. Today we, with this, we, today we have eight units of this tricycle with Unilever, three with Purina. Today we are designing the scale up of, of this with uh, Unilever here in Chile. One month ago, we launched in New York, in Brooklyn with Clorox and Colgate. At the end of November, we're gonna be launching in Indonesia with a local partner with Unilever Nestle. Uh, and the idea is to replicate this through franchise model to have some different companies that are gonna represent Algramo. We are working under the context of the Paris Agreement 2030, and we realized based on our previous experience that people takes around four years as a society to switch a behavior, not 21 days as they say some books. Uh, this takes time, so we are trying to be in, in 2025 in the main economy. We're building contracts and relations with the biggest brand and with the biggest uh, local operators to have operations there. And the idea is to replicate this with the same technology. So we are offering the cheapest solution, uh, ensuring the traceability of the product, the quality. We are using the existing brands. I would say that the people doesn't need more brands of laundry detergent. We need to move from single use to refill. And to do that, we are offering this, this solution. We're building partnership also with retailers to have the volume with mom pop stores, with open uh, or fresh markets. Depends on the culture, what is the solution that we're gonna implement. But the idea is to replicate this uh, as soon as possible. Um, and actually, we're, we're closing this year our, our funding round to scale up. We're gonna be doing some pilot next year in Europe. We're exploring UK and France where they're more strict about packaging. And this year we're closing contracts for Latin, for Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. So what we're trying to do is to be on time with the solution, leveraging um, the efforts of different companies. Most of them, they have this global commitment on plastic, but they don't really know how to get there. So we're trying to help them to, to be there. And, and again, this is a solution that makes sense in the context of uh, mom and pop stores in a low income area in Santiago, but also could work in, I don't know, in Denmark in an eco-friendly context because we're solving the poverty tax from one side, but also the packaging waste and we're trying to build alliances with different uh, partners, actually as the uh, Universidad Católica, that we're uh, co-working in some challenges to, to work with. So really do happy to be here, open to, to questions. And this is in 12 minutes what we're doing and where we're going with that. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Jose, for your very brief presentation. Uh, we have some questions for uh, our presenters. But in this moment, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Valentina Gianfrate and uh, Roberto Iniguez, wh whom they will moderate the round table now. Uh, interesting questions also. The approach from Jose Moller was about the ethical and economical sustainable approaches. Uh, and I think that uh, you three presenters have uh, complete a very good, a very, very interesting approach to the responsible innovation uh, approach by design. So uh, interesting pr uh, questions now and probably uh, Valentina and Roberto will comment also and, and articulate all the questions. So many thanks for your, all your presentations, and I hope that uh, this will stimulate a very good discussion in the following section. Welcome, Roberto and Valentina. Thank you, thank you so much, Rodrigo. And um, 
we are here as a moderator. Thank you for uh, your uh, contributes because uh, you are the representative of three different profiles and backgrounds uh, and uh, you give us uh, an overview of the complexity of uh, these topics uh, related to the responsible innovation um, and uh, also the impact of uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, intervention uh, on the different domain of uh, the daily life. So uh, from more conscious products uh, to ed education uh, to urban services. So um, I find found your intervention very interesting uh, also because it, it is possible to uh, recognize common uh, aspects, uh, your uh, political and personal effort uh, to be part of the change. And it is very, very interesting. Uh, the research importance to anticipate needs uh, and solution, but also the mediator role of, um, of the design uh, of the designer in the, in the society. So these, uh, these are my uh, first impressions, uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, Roberto wants to um, integrate a little bit this uh, uh, introduction, and then we can move to the to the questions from uh, the public. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much, and thank you all. It's, 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 it's great to be together on this uh, adventure, um, and 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 all focus on this very important and central topic for the future of of society and the planet, not just for the future of design. So I, I am very first to express my, my gratitude to, to all of you, to the Universidad de Bologna and the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and the great colleagues that are connected here and the people in the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think that we have had a, a wonderful um, uh, examples of different approaches uh, uh, regards the, the, the topic and and now uh, I think that the, the table is set in, in, uh, uh, in, in because we, we all, we, we all, with these three different approaches, we have seen the, the, the idea of uh, engagement as a, an activity that's designed more and more is, is, is trying to uh, lead, how to engage the different stakeholders and to create platforms for that. Uh, the idea also of entrepreneurship and create opportunities that can change uh, the way we uh, understand business and create a more conscious business approach. And also the idea of, of activism to how to create participatory platforms for, for that. Uh, uh, I think that I, I'm sure that my, 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 my words are too short to resume the wonderful ideas that our speakers already presented, but yeah, we can go for uh, to the discussion. Valentina, if you if you if you you are okay, uh, would you like to launch the first question, or, or may may I launch it? Mm, I can uh, launch the first one and. Okay, uh, go. Uh, this uh, this question is for uh, all the three uh, key speakers. And uh, during uh, the COVID-19 lockdown and post-pandemic experience, uh, the necessity to intercept the needs uh, of large segments of the population has become an opportunity to define uh, responsible measures to counter the effects of the epidemic on a social and economic scale. In many cases, experimental self-produced prototypal initiatives have been realized with the pivotal objective to maintain acceptable quality of life, even in emergency periods. Is it possible, in your opinion, to talk about design for preparedness, uh, able to anticipate the future emergency situation of various nature, assuming their impact, especially on the most fragile categories, and identify su suitable solutions to mitigate their negative effects on people's life? It's a very long uh, question. <laughs> um, if you, if some of you want to, uh... I would, I would venture. It, it is quite a challenge of a question, and I think it's a very broad. <laughs> yes, it is. Probably it goes to the to the center of of, of, our, of the discussion and, and the future of the, of the disciplines. Um, but I would say that the, the short answer is yes. I think there is a, a very big role to play, and I I'm just wondering, sort of, you know, what uh, Ligia and, and Jose Manuel might think about this and others, but. Um, I think that uh, the in, in 
emergency is always uh, catch us by surprise, no? And, and I think this, this processes that we've been discussing in terms of how we, we do engagement and all these kinds of participatory processes uh, as part of the nature of our activity. And, and I think we've done it for many years and we do it better and better every year. Uh, it would, would allow us to, to address these uh, emergent problems uh, in, a, in a better way. But I do think that there's a role to play, of course, in terms of mediating and understanding what the uh, different actors uh, and, and different elements of a, of a pandemic such as this, for example, uh, might might um, provide or could, could provide for a possible solution or a way to address it in the future. So I think that, yes, that there's a, a very big role to play there. Thank you, Mar. Thank you, Mar. Ligia, Jose Manuel, would, would like to add something else or, 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 or should I jump to, the, uh, uh, to another question? Well, I, 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 I agree with Mark. And um, well, I always work with the most fragile categories of design. <laughs> That's the kind of work that I do. But uh, I, I, I believe that we can anticipate something and also to prepare, but you have to be a strategical and also, uh, well, as a government, they, they, we have to put design in the, in, the, in the curriculum of the governments because we, I, th I think we had the strategical part to do it in the government to anticipate this kind of, well, in terms of sustainability, what happened is that uh, I believe that we are going back because now we look, um, maybe I will do it in Spanish now. Can I do it? Can I speak in Spanish a little bit? Yes, yes, go ahead, por favor. Sí. Lo, lo que quería decir es que, bien, en, en términos de sustentabilidad, lo que estamos haciendo ahora es volver un poco atrás, porque estamos en, en la situación, cuando se pasan las emergencias, lo que se vaya a pasar es que vamos a, a, a prestar atención a la emergencia. Y nos estamos olvidando de todo el proceso que estábamos haciendo en términos de la selección de materiales, de los procesos menos, menos poluentes. Eh, todo el proceso estaba siendo observado por los diseñadores. Estábamos escogiendo lo mejor producto, los mejores materiales. Bien, estábamos cuestionando la, las cosas. Ahora, en situaciones de emergencia, como, como lo vas a ver las mascarillas, es una situación de que, como lo abre en portugués, va a todo. Que todo se pueda pasar porque estamos atendiendo a la emergencia. Nos vamos a dejar para atrás todo el trayecto de, de preocupación, de, de sustentabilidad de los materiales y de, de, del ambiente. Bien, pero los diseños tienen una capacidad de, 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 de hacer esta mirada un poco más ad, adelante, ¿no? de preparar todo eso, pero tiene que estar en la, en la, en la, en la gestión de los, de los cambios de la sociedad, de la, la política, como decía, no es la política partidaria, es la política de eh, anticipar lo que, lo que, cómo vamos a pensar en, ter, en términos culturales, sociales, eh, los cambios, eh, preparar los cambios. Muchas gracias, Ligia. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I, um, you, you were mentioned in regard the the business and, and, and company and how to anticipate changes. Um, I would like to 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 underline the, this idea that, that that the traditional way to see business sometimes have a it's, it's a different agenda than. And, and, and also sometimes conflicting agenda uh, uh, for sustainability. I, I mean, uh, uh, how, and, and the stakeholders around, around that, that includes government, organizations, of course, society and, and entrepreneurship, um, they, they don't have the same objectives. So, so um, how, how to deal with that, no? and how could we set the table for 
this kind of stakeholder discussion and and to to try to connect the dots and find the common common purposes you know, with with this idea that more and more in in the, in, in the in the world of businesses are talking this idea of conscious businesses how how to do it i mean i'm very interested in that some of the questions in the chat i think are connected with that uh, jose manuel you have a great and long experiences on on, on on doing that and mark you have been uh, using the keyword of, uh, of, of uh, engagement for that and well you are very active also uh, Ligia in, 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 in connecting people. Uh, how could we deal with that conflicting agendas? Could be the question. Maybe I can, I can start with this one. Um, I would say that there are two main sides. One, I would say that there is a huge today disconnection between the corporate world or the companies and the users. Uh, most of the decision makers are businessmen that make decisions based on an Excel and a PPT, and they don't know even their users, their pains, uh, their reasons to purchase something. For example, today, uh, when I have, have having some conversation with several companies, for example, let's use uh, the third team as an example. They're saying, okay, my I know my customers because they love my brand, etc. But what I'm proposing them that actually, and, I'm, and this is quite common, People already know what are the brands that are good enough to wash your clothes. And they pick the one that is cheaper. It's not like you don't really love the brand for your clothes. Yeah, you're just picking the, the cheapest one. And I'm trying to, to show them that the reason of why the user is picking one or another is because, first of all, they can afford it. It's flexible for them. And third, they mean something in terms of not of the brand, the purpose that is behind. So what they're trying to do, all the companies today, they're switching from traditional to this millennial or centennial approach because they know that the millennials has the money to pay their product, not because they're rethinking the way how to make business. So I would say that it's still a disconnection. They're just switching because this is what marketing has to do. But I've not seen a, a, a deep reflection in terms of what should be the approach and how we learn from our users. So uh, again, so I would say that that's one, one side that the disconnection between the companies and the user. And second, uh, I would say that the design of that solution could be a uh, co-design. Because again, you could be the best designer, but if you're not into the field, piloting, testing, failing fast and trying new things, you're gonna spend a semester, a year, designing something that even the people does, that even don't understand. For example, for us, it's really challenging because we're adding a lot of technology of something that today, currently, it's quite basic, like just purchasing a product from a shelf and then you pay. Today, we are adding a chip, an app, and to explain that, we have to be really close with our users. And I, I would say that also we have been changing and, and co-designing many things with them because we understand that they're the, the decision maker. And what I'm trying to switch them, not to get more detergent. To be honest, I don't care about detergent or pet food. I am trying to switch their behavior for more a sustainable one and to help them to not pay the poverty tax. And what is in, in between that, it's useful but I'm not there for push, pushing on a specific product. I'm there to understanding their needs and co design with them. Yeah, I, I would, that's a, a very good definition. I, I would also, um, this make, makes me think of, and I think that uh, uh, Jose Manuel probably went very, very fast in his project in, in, uh, and he did show some of it, but I think it, there's so much work behind understanding the processes and understanding the system that is evident. And I'm sure also Nihia, her, her examples were so also very much uh, the descriptions of very profound and very uh, time consuming processes of understanding clients. So I think I, I agree that this is uh, uh, the way, this is the only way that we can uh, work around this, this disconnect that uh, Jose Manuel was describing. You know? And it makes me think of this uh, definition. I think that uh, the founder of Waze uh, had at, at, at very at the beginning, the, the would repeat that he didn't fall in love with his solution, but he f fell in love with the problem. So I think this is the kind of tools that we bring as designers very much into the into the field. And I think where the key might lie, know that we bring this view of understanding the problem very deeply and mapping it in a systemic way. And this is the only thing we can the only way we can approach it. And then the other pieces of mediation, how we use certain tools to mediate 
and, and, and broaden the discussions. Because I, I do think that there is a, more and more a, an awareness of businesses of the, co the complexity that they're facing. Um, there, I think there was a question in the chat about that, uh, but they are becoming aware of the complexities. Uh, many of them are, are not <laughs> there yet, but I think we have to take advantage of that and, and make sure that we can get inside business and, 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 trans, uh, and, and make these arguments and make these processes more, more palpable and more uh, efficient for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And uh, I think that we can read some, uh, some questions from the public. Um, for instance, uh, I have a, a question for, uh, uh, for Lija, and this is from a PhD student in design of the University of Bologna, Clara Giardina. And uh, she asked you, in um, your work, ethics, collaboration and awareness have an important place in design processes. There is a specific role that women can have in conscious design, and if so, what are their specificity that can bring value in these processes? Well, I, I don't see me as a woman in the role of designer. I see me as a designer. Um, well, um, I'm fortunate because, well, I'm an industrial designer. In the year that I, I graduate, I was, my, my, my class, we are like 70% are women. <laughs> so industrial design is, is not supposed, but now there, things are changing. I don't believe that my, my skills are connected to, be a wom to being a woman or a man. I see me as a, you know, as a, I see my skill as a human being. And, um, well, but I don't know what she expect with this, with this, uh, with this questions, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, in some point, my, my friends say that I'm kind of maternal in the, in the way they that connect with people in my projects. And well, it could be, but I, I have a really good uh, partners, men, <laughs> men partners, and they do the, the, in the same way. That, so I, I don't believe that I see me as a designer, not a woman in design. And I don't want to see me as a woman because I, I believe in equity, equality, <laughs> And well, I don't see me like that. Okay, thank you so much. Roberto, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, continuing with the questions in the chat that we are receiving more and more. Thank you very much to all the participants. The, the chat is very, very active. Um, this one is uh, um, uh, for Mark Wood uh, from Clara Giardina. Uh, Clara, grazie mille. Uh, today, to, uh, <laughs> Uh, today's company are faced with new challenges that have to do uh, with climate and health issues, first and, and foremost. Uh, in this challenge context, uh, context, it is clear that companies uh, can no longer move in isolation, but rather in an integrated and connected way. Do you believe that design-driven mediation platforms can facilitate the integration between companies in the same supply chain? in order to face today's challenges with greater resilience. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, the question is connected to this idea of uh, design-driven mediation, uh, Mark. Yes, thank you, thank you Roberto. And I, yes, I, I completely agree. They say, I think there's a phrase no, that says that a good emer an emergency is a, a, a great thing to waste. No, it's something very good that we don't, shouldn't waste in terms of, of what might happen. I think uh, as the question says, uh, companies are very aware, uh, aware, I think, in general of the urgency of uh, health and, and uh, environmental issues at, at this point. I, I mean, the pandemic is connected, uh, of course, to environmental aspects. And, and I think I, I showed the, the, the wicked problem map that, that Terry Irwin developed and that there's another extraordinary map uh, that you can find online in terms of the, of the COVID pandemic and what the implications and connections are with different aspects. So um, I, I think that the, as the question implies, I think the, the, it says that precisely this uh, urgency that, that companies have, have uh, 
come to, to see and probably governments as well uh, should be the spur, the, the, the motivation for them to, to uh, uh, address a, a more systemic view. Uh, the, the question talks about how companies in the same supply chain might, might uh, uh, be mediated, mediated or can discuss in terms of how they might face uh, together challenges and, and, and have greater resilience. So I, I do think that um, design has a great, great uh, uh, opportunity to bring again the, the tools of mediation and the tools of understanding the problem deeply. Uh, why, when we do the mapping of, of, of a wicked problem, we see the connections to other industries, to other uh, uh, companies in the same supply chain. So definitely this is something that we have to bring to the table and, and in order to, to understand the problem in a more complex way and, and try to figure out uh, ways to respond in the future in a more adequate way. I agree with Felicia when she said that uh, we have to go back probably to, to understand what we were trying to do uh, in the direction that we have and how the pandemic has upended some of that, has transformed some of those uh, responses and perhaps design better ways in the future to, to readdress those issues and, and, and the, the, the good steps that we already had in, in some cases. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, now um, I have a question from uh, another PhD student of uh, the University of Bologna, Valentina De Matteo, and uh, it is for uh, uh, Jose Moller, uh, and it is about uh, the specific uh, uh, area of uh, specific sector in which uh, your service uh, um, has been uh, developed. So uh, um, waste management is sometimes perceived as a not so attractive attractive topic for organization. How to help them to increase their awareness on the topic and shift from an exploitation to a regeneration organizational culture? That's a really good question. I don't know if we're gonna address that, but something that maybe could help is um, today in Algorama, what we are saying that we want to make recycling obsolete. That Sounds quite bizarre coming from LATAM at least because we're just starting to recycling things and we are saying that we want to make recycling obsolete. Because I would say that waste is the, is the symptom, not the, not the problem. So we are, we are trying to solve the waste when it's already done. So we're trying to solve this upstream. And this is not only related with the packaging, it's also related with the business plan of the companies. So for example, let's give you an, an easy example. Coke. Coke, they have this Coca-Cola company, global company, and they have bottlers in different countries. And they define themselves as bottlers. So they're defined based on a packaging. So they're already defined as someone that is producing packaging. And when we're trying to work with them on, on different several partners, is to help them to switch, first of all, from the business. Because if you don't change the, 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 the board, the, the business of the company, it's going to be really difficult to, at the end, trying to solve a waste problem. So we're trying to switch uh, the business definition to them. Okay, you're going to be selling product, not waste. And then if we are thinking packaging as the way to people can keep reusing that and a vehicle to consume all the time the same product, then waste is just a definition. So today we have a lot of waste problem because we didn't realize that it was a convention. Today, for example, an example I use all the time, um, a credit card, for example, I have one here. So a credit card has almost the same amount of plastic as a bottle. But if you are walking and then you find a, a credit card or a metro card, you're going to pick it up. Why? Because you know that has value. And everyone, we agree on, okay, this plastic has more value than this other one. But we could change that. And actually what we're trying to change is to transform the packaging into a wallet. So then if you find a, a bottle, for example, that has a chip, for you will be the same as this. And yes, yes, it's just a convention. So we're trying to use design to show that, okay, the experience around packaging could be totally different. And if we change that, even the definition of waste doesn't exist. So we're trying to approach this upstream, not downstream, and try to also evolve the business, because that's really important. This has to be a better business for the brands, otherwise it's not gonna scale, but also give the enough incentives to switch that behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Manuel. A wonderful example regarding the plastic. Um, uh, there is another one. This, this is for, for you, Ligia, um, from, from Elena Bay. 
a very a very great colleague. I, I take advantage to say to, to, to send greetings to her. Um, and it says uh, uh, concerning your creative and ethical way to run projects, uh, do you have a personal engaging model based on human responsibility? I, I think that the question is connected to to, to your model of of, 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 of engaging these, these, these ideas around uh, to the project. Uh, hello, Elena. Say hi also. <laughs> um, well, um, I change, uh, I, I never, I have to adapt all, always the methodology uh, for each project because I have to study the, not the users, but the la gente, uh, people, um, have to study uh, who is going to participate, uh, for who uh, is this, uh, what, I, what I really want to achieve. And of course, there are some um, uh, personal, uh, um, is a personal way to do it, but I never repeat because, first, because I, I believe that. Um, I'm not repeating uh, the same person or the same users because I'm never repeat. I never repeat briefings because I'm not working with the same student. And uh, is a pers if is personal, uh, of course, is in uh, in the first years uh, it was very difficult to work with this these groups because I was personally involved, very involved, and. Uh, it was very emotional and um, I take with me some, you know, some thoughts or bad thoughts that I bring from the communities, for example. And, but now I think this, I change uh, and I use my personal um, background and I use my personal experience to change uh, the the methodology methodologies because I I need to adapt to that community. It's not because it's my methodology or my way to do it. It's just because I need to adapt to the, to that community or that uh, project in itself. But of course, it's all is about ethics and trying trying to achieve the best way to do it. I I, I don't believe that. One thing that uh, is is my concern all the time is the expectation that that I create in the people that uh, collaborate with me, not uh, design collaborators. Uh, I mean the users, collaborators, and communities. Um, managing the the expectation that people uh, are trying to put on you, and you put on the others is is the is the Thing that I have my more more concern in the project because it's very um, well. In the end, if you, for example, if you do something with the university and you are trying to involve the community, you have to say that it is a, 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 a academic project, and because people are try, always trying to put on you some expect, personal expectations that you are going to change our life or the way they do it or the community. And my concern is always uh, about uh, the expectation that I create based on ethics also, but uh, well, is, is always my personal ethical concern. It's not, you, you can't find ethical uh, um, for, for a platform that you achieve ethical, uh, you, you look for ethical problems in design, you found a solution. You have to follow your rules and your ethical, just looking for the best for that community or that group. I don't know if I was very clear, but, um, uh, it's not just about my personal and uh, engagement. It's about community engagement. I never work alone. I see as a whole group. Thank you. Thank you, Lija. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, you work a lot with the different uh, typology of communities and uh, um, on field. So it's uh, very... 
uh, very impressive also the results, uh, the final results that are tangible and uh, visible and it is uh, very interesting because uh, they are such touch points uh, of, uh, of the final work of, uh, of the community. And um, so um, my question is more related to the uh, digital environment and uh, about, uh, for instance, uh, the technological innovation. Uh, so we are in a era in which the technological innovation, ICT and new techs uh, um, are uh, uh, a little bit risky uh, to be um, adopting as uh, as well. So um, the question is about uh, the possibility to adopt them uh, as uh, enabling tools uh, to democratize uh, and uh, to open uh, knowledge, uh, resources uh, and data and uh, to uh, create uh, enlarged networks uh, of a community that can collaborate also in different parts of, uh, of the world. This is one of uh, our challenges, for instance, in this uh, in this winter school, but uh, um, we are very interested also in uh, your opinion of uh, all the three about uh, this uh, specific point. I don't know if uh, someone uh, wants to start, uh, for instance, Mark. Uh, or... um, well, I <laughs> I think uh, in, in general, I was trying to look for the, for the code, exact code, but uh, in general, I think technology doesn't have uh, uh, embedded morals in it. No, I think it's the users and the way we, we address them and we, and we bring them to, to our uh, human work that uh, in, in, in includes the morality or the ethics in, in it. No? Um, I think that uh, the the example of Jose Manuel is also very interesting in terms of how technology is used to address and to transform the perception of the problem itself and the and of the perception of the different actors. No? So definitely, um, this is something that we cannot just leave uh, automatically to, to happen. I think we have to harness it and we have to take advantage of it. And there's many ways, I think, in, te in which the technology can, can be addressed. No? I was thinking of how participation, for example, of society can um, can can be harnessed and can be improved by by the use of different technologies and uh, of course that that implies also another ethical issue in terms of the access to technology that the different communities have no and, and that that doesn't become an exclusion uh, a way of excluding others in in, in the discussion but um I'm, I'm, that's not the my first reaction in terms of of uh, how uh, this can be included in our in our processes and and I think the whole pandemic has also thrown us in a way of trying to understand how, how the different uses of technology and distance learning can, can really help us in, in, in addressing and understanding the problems. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, um, the, the organization is telling me that we are running out of time. I, I think the, the, the chat still have questions and I still have like uh, 80 three or, or a hundred, something like that, questions. Uh, well, too many. Uh, but uh, I, I think that this, this, this conversation was the, is, is the, it's a great beginning for, for what we are going to have. Um, maybe we could, uh, could I propose just one last uh, quick round with oh, oh, taking advantage that you are here. Is that we are so privileged that we have very inspiring panelists. And, and it will be wonderful to hear from you since we are in, in an academic forum, um, which, which will be you, your recommendation for future designers regards responsible innovation, which, which is something that we, 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 we should emphasize with, with, with our students that are going to face uh, the future that uh, uh, practice. Um, yeah, maybe we could do a very, a quick round and if you could help us with that will be a wonderful I think close taking advantage of, 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 of your inspiring uh, words who, who would like to start I, I can start if, if you want thank you um, Manuel. really quick and direct I would say that three main things the first one it's purpose uh, if we're 
especially if you're studying design, you have a huge chance to have impact on others and think really well why you want to do what you're going to be doing. Uh, today, we need solutions for many, many problems and we don't need another app to, I don't know, decide where to go to a bar. We need to address the challenge that we have as a, as a region, as a world. That's the first one. Second, in that context, the solution should be and must be radical. We need to switch behavior in many, many areas and we need radical people with radical ideas to change uh, this, this context. And the third one that could help around that is would be the collaboration. At least for, uh, for me, they didn't teach me this in the university, in economics. They teach you how to compete, not to, uh, how to collaborate. Uh, and this is something that we should be trained and we should learn uh, because this is the only way to be successful and to, and to enjoy the, the, the solution. So I would say purpose, radical solution and collaboration. And thanks for the opportunity to, to have me here and all the panelists. Great presentation. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Gracias. Ligia, Mark. Sí, puedo. Por favor, Ligia. Um, so I'd like to say to the future designers, as I say it to my students, and they have to be the engagement, commitment, and uh, also uh, think about the project. I have the same commitment or same engagement if I work with IKEA or if I, if I work with uh, cra some craftsmen around the, who lives next to my, my, my house. It's the same commitment, it's the same engagement. And uh, I think we should uh, add value to the, the, the process and also to, to measure the impact is the same if you have to to the, to work with 50 people or 1000 the impact could be huge for one person or five persons and also enjoy enjoy is <laughs> very important uh, sense of humor we are look we are talking about responsible but you can use the, your humor to be responsible and enjoy the, the uh, to be a designer I think is using the sense of humor as a designer is one thing that they are most important in life and as a designer. It's the same way, being a designer uh, as a person. Well, um, and perhaps thanks to these two ideas, uh, I was going back to uh, some of the experiences that we've had in terms of uh, getting professors and students from different disciplines to collaborate on a single project uh, and what, how uncomfortable some of the actors were in that process in terms of having to get out of their own definitions and their own ways of doing things. Uh, in some cases, they even sighed when they went back to their silos into their disciplinary activity. So I guess my recommendation has to do with this idea of collaboration and this idea of enjoying is to um, give yourself um, in this again goes to professors as well, but but to students or future designers, give yourself permission to be um, comfortable in in messy surroundings. I think participation and interdisciplinary work will get you out of your comfort zone. It will challenge your 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 knowledge. It will challenge your your processes, your your methodologies, and uh, so I, I think. Uh, that's what education in many ways is for, to get out of your comfort zone and understand more things. Uh, and uh, that would be, I guess, my, my general advice. Uh, when when the, Jose Manuel was talking about radical solutions, I think that has to do also with questioning profoundly things and being comfortable with that, the uncertainty that that, that might uh, develop. That's also a very good preparation, I think, for the uncertain future and for the volatile world that we live in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ligia, Mark, and, and Jose, Man Jose Manuel for the wonderful contribution and for this last work. Uh, I think that we got to close. I will, I will also like to, to thank the organization for this uh, 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 panel and for inviting us. Valentina. Yes, thank you also from my side. And uh, it is very inspiring also for uh, my current work uh, as a, a teacher, but also as a designer and also as a practitioner. So thank you so much for uh, your presence here. 
Thank you, Roberto, and uh, thank you all. And uh, uh, I just remember that in uh, the next uh, uh, weeks, uh, uh, it will be published the call for participants uh, to apply uh, to the winter school that uh, will be held in January and uh, at the end of, uh, of June. So um, I invite all the students connected to uh, take an account and to stay tuned to um, apply and uh, participate to this uh, experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for everyone. If we, if we will be in a presential mode, there will be a big applause for, for you all. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank to you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Gracias a la organización, a todo el equipo de atrás. Thanks for everyone. Look forward to continuing the collaboration. Take care. Thank you very much. Very much. Gracias, Lilia, Mark y José. Un gran Santiago. Igualmente, gracias, Rodrigo. Hasta luego. Nos vemos en el futuro. Sí, sea.